that'll be cleaner. Okay. Uh, so uh, now I want to talk about uh, just the biological context for our wetland understanding. And I'm going to use um, salt marshes as, as my default example of, of a type of wetland because that's mostly what we're gonna be um, focusing on our field trips and, and things of that nature. Um, but, but these concepts apply to most, if not all wetland systems. Everybody's good, right? Everybody can hear me and everything's cool? Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. All right, so um, we're gonna talk about community ecology, biotic regions. We might talk a little bit about our organisms, but I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna record that offline for you guys because we want to have time to talk about our field of dreams today. So I want to make sure we have at least a good hour for that. Um, okay, so, uh, but, but the, the, out, the, the outcome from this is I want you guys to understand about the basics of community ecology as, as they relate to wetlands, some of the gross biological, biotic regions. And then I want you guys to be familiar with common wetland crit common wetland organisms. And again, to pick something, we're gonna pick salt marshes as our organizing principle. Many of these uh, critters that exist in, say our, the freshwater edges of our salt marshes are also present in our other wetland systems in, in Southern California. Um, but but we're, we're just gonna use that as, the, as uh, the organizing unit, or the organizing community for which to begin to um, learn a few, few critters. Um, okay, so to start with uh, community ecology, I want to just emphasize the importance of simplified systems first. We'll talk then about zonation and a little bit about succession. Um, okay, so community ecology. So, so we'll talk about, let me first mention zonation and then we'll get into this, the, the value of simplified systems. But, but um, zonation, when we say zonation, what we're referring to is repeated, consistent patterns in space for how organisms are distributed. So recurring patterns, recurring patterns um, of how the trees are located on which face of the hill. And there's a certain type of, say, tree on the top of the hill, a certain type of tree in the middle part of the hill, a certain part of the uh, tree in, in plant community and the meadow bottom of the hill, for example, um, et cetera. It's easiest to see zonation, even though zonation occurs in many places in soil horizons and all kinds of stuff. It's most conspicuous, it's easiest to see with critters that don't move, so sessile organisms, and intertidal organisms are the classic one. You can see it in hillside vegetation, you can see it with things like lichens, but, but intertidal invertebrates are really the classic example of where we can, anybody can see this. So somebody that's never taken a biology class in their life can walk up to the coast and look at it and, and, and get this idea very, very quickly. I'll also say that zonation, even though we tend to focus on zonation because of that great example of the intertidal in this very uh, uh, restricted area, zonation does happen over many, or can happen over many scales. Uh, through time and through space. Okay, so here's our Southern California uh, rocky intertidal classic example. Man, that looks a little pixelated. I should, I should get a new, I should redo this figure, apologies. Um, so um, what we're looking at, we're looking at um, a rocky part of a coastline. And here is the area most up in the air, most dry, dry most of the time. Here is the area of the rocky substrate that is underwater almost all the time. So the first thing to say is this is an intertidal system. So by definition, it is never entirely in the air. It is never entirely underwater. Now, it might only be wet, you know, during a storm surge kind of thing, during a big storm event type deal. And this area right here might only be dry or exposed to the air in the lowest of the low, 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 low tides, maybe only once or twice a year kind of thing, you know, in extreme, extreme events. But, but that's what's defining our area we're talking about here. Okay, so that's the area we're talking about. Now, as you look in the, in the diagram, what you see is you see different, crit, different critters, algae, 
invertebrates, et cetera, down here. See a, a bit less up here. And then as we go up here, we see um, fewer still and uh, less diverse critters. So these critters tend to have hard parts, shells and such. Down here, fleshy, fleshy anemones, fleshy, fleshy algal fronds, things of that nature. So this is a, a, what it looks like at um, uh, Leo Creo State Beach during a low tide. Um, and uh, and so, so here, so we look at this, right? So we have the water, here's the lowest part. Here is the uh, high, the most dry area, the place that gets the least amount of water. And we have different things here. So one, there's some sea grasses and there's some, some obviously fleshy like things in here, right? At this point, I don't know what they are, doesn't matter. There's just stuff, right? Then we have some mobile stuff here. So these are Pisaster ocreaceous. These are our, our sea stars. And these, these dudes are hanging out around here, right? They're, they're pretty much boom down this area. If we look up a little bit higher, we see this kind of, um, uh, and, and tell me how, I'll pause a second. Tell me how your guys' Zoom connection is. Does this picture look relatively crisp? This last one, this last one was lame. This, this one is not a very crisp picture. I should replace it. But I'm curious, in right. your, in your yeah, Zoom, does this look like a good picture? That's good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Just want to make sure that you guys can see everything. Um, okay. Thank you for that. So, okay. So, so then we have the sea stars, and then we have this stuff right up here, right? So, so these are some uh, gooseneck barnacles. So, in fact, it doesn't even matter. These are a, these are a different critter. These are a different critter. Okay. And then we see that 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 sort of dark paint or, 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 or greenish, dark greenish paint is here to here, right? Then we go above it and now we hit this area where there doesn't look like there's that much stuff. And then we go to this upper layer and now there's muscles or, 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 or a, a dark shaped thing, right? There's muscles up here. So we have the dark shaped thing layer. We have the, you know, not so much layer. We have the sort of dark green paint layer. We have the sea star layer. We have this layer, right? So that's classic zonation. This is being driven by tides. This is being driven by different exposure to water. Um, the most important area for the, um, certainly for the development of the field of ecology, okay, I'll, I'll step back a little bit. So ecology used to be known as natural history. The term ecology only really came to use in basically the mid, middle part of the 1900s. Before then, the stuff that you and I would think of as ecology, how many deer we have in the valley, uh, uh, how birds reproduce, you know, that kind of stuff, we refer to that as natural history. So the history, but the history of nature. Natural history is still a fundamental part of ecology, of biology, and programs that don't strongly emphasize natural history are ones that are not worth participating in, in my opinion. Um, might be a little biased here. Um, uh, way too much biology has gone to molecular, all that kind of stuff, and, and they, they've never been out in a park, they've never been out in nature, and they do not know how natural systems function, and they use all these fantastic tools that are dis dissociated from nature. Um, okay, so, so when natural history was evolving into ecology, ecology is, is a modern rigorous science. And one of the first things that transformed natural history was statistics, quantification, robust measurement, robust hypothesis testing. Now, we could test hypotheses in the middle of the Amazon rainforest. We could test it on a coral reef. All right, we could, we could do it wherever. But turns out when you're starting to understand something, oftentimes it's hard to jump into the middle of a massive complex thing. It's usually easier to bite off a little teeny tiny piece and to get the insights from a, a smaller part or a more simplified part of the <clears throat> otherwise more complex system. Hence, intertidal areas. In the Rocky intertidal in particular is where Joe Connell, one of the godfathers of modern ecology, first did his work. So he was in, um, he was in uh, World War II. And he uh, was a radar operator when radar was a brand new technology. So he was stationed in Scotland. So he was supposed to look for Nazi warplanes and stuff of that nature. Um, and he finished that up and then he had his GI Bill and he said, I think I might want to go to college. 
So he went to college, went to school in the UK. And he started working on rabbits. He liked rabbits. And then he said, rabbits suck. So he liked to, like rabbits like this. Like, like we have rabbits in my house, even on my pillows in my house. Um, so he like, started working on rabbits. And then he had a horrible time. He wasted a whole year. He's like, rabbits are a pain in the arse. You can't catch them. They're super wily. I hate them. So then he invented Joe Connell's rule of thumb. Joe Connell's rule of thumb was never work on a critter larger than your thumb. So you can, they're easy. And so he started knocking around and he, he'd stumbled into the inner title and he stu stumbled into this exact thing that you're looking at here, um, zonation. And so he did his experiments with barnacles and why, how barnacles are where they are, how they're distributed. And he basically invented our modern or gave us our modern conceptualization of competition. So to this day, every time you open a biological textbook, the textbook definition of competition are barnacles in the inner title. That's be, so the value of a simplified system is tremendous. From that simplified idea of competition, we then went on to test competition in much more complex, more diverse systems and have shown that the basic tenets hold up and are valuable. So, so simplified systems are really helpful in terms of understanding what's going on, particularly if we're just getting into the system. Okay, that's zonation. We'll see zonation play out in many different ways in our wetlands and in, con in consequence have multiple implications for restoration or, or have implications for restoration. So this example, which is also, I'm looking at, it seems a little blurry, lame. I have to fix this image too. Um, this is uh, an example from an East Coast salt marsh, but the same principles apply in whatever system we're talking about. And so here's an, so we're on the East Coast now and we're looking inland our, so our, 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 sorry, we're looking, um, uh, our butt is to, the, um, is to the mainland and we're looking oceanward. There's a little island between us and the ocean. Um, and so what you see is you see herbaceous stuff, right? So we already know this is called a marsh, right? By definition, because it's, it's herbaceous plant uh, wetland. Uh, there's a tidal channel at the, at, the sort of the break right here, this is, this is salt water. This is a sort of mudflat salt water area. But in between there and, and us are all these, all these plants. And if you look close, it might be hard to see, but if you stare for a second, you'll see there's relatively tall, right? Relatively tall plants. And then over here, uh, it might be hard to see, but this is small plants, okay? And so these have not been mowed. This is not a golf course or anything. This is the natural growth of, of these, uh, these grasses. And so it turns out this is one species and this is another species. So Spartina is a classic uh, coastal wetland species. And um, Spartina, this, this is the genus of this plant, Spartina dominated marshes are very, very common across most of the US, because most of our uh, US coastal shorelines and indeed across much of the world. Um, and so what we're seeing here is even in this, what looks to be very, very flat, right? It's not straight up and down like the rocks at Leo Carrillo. It's very, very flat by, by comparison. But even there, we're seeing differences in plant type based on elevation. And so this is, uh, uh, what, what's essentially going on. So here we have our, our, elevational, our elevational difference, right? So here's our, our, our sediments. And here's the tidal creek, let's say. So here's the intertidal, this is the, the bottom range of the intertidal. Up here is the, the upper range of the intertidal. And uh, so the water goes up and down daily with tidal uh, coming in, coming out. And we see that there's uh, this Spartina zone here. Above it, we're describing this as a salicornia zone. That's, that's the pickleweed stuff. That's the stuff that we have in our uh, areas uh, of our, most of our coastal salt marshes here in, in Southern California. And so we see this zonation. It doesn't matter if it's rocky intertidal. It doesn't matter if it's mud flat or soft bottom intertidal. Pretty much any intertidal system we will see, and for that matter, for any wetland system, we'll see some level of zonation. And so here's an example closer to home. So here we go. So here is the tidal creek or the, or the water, the low point. Here's the terrestrial area up high. This is actually, what is this? this oh, this is Malibu Lagoon before 
our most recent restoration there. So um, uh, this is water. This is mudflat or, 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 or devegetated areas. So just algae grown there. We see some rack deposited. Uh, we, then we, and again, rack, if I haven't defined it yet for you guys, rack spelled W-R-A-C-K. Rack is um, stuff that was originally alive, but has a, you know, part of a plant, could be a branch, could be a stipe from a, from a kelp individual. It's broken off and is floating around. It's not necessarily dead. It could be dead now, but it's not necessarily dead, but it can't continue its typical life because it's no longer attached, no longer fixed in terms of wherever it was originally growing. So rack is essentially biological floating material that used to be attached somewhere, attached in the river corridor, attached on the offshore reef, something of that nature. And so in this case, all this light gray um, sticks and twigs and, and the like is rack, W-R-A-C-K. Okay, then above that, we, we see our salicornia, right? So this is our, the common name is pickleweed this pickleweed zone, okay? And then, and I'm simplifying things. So there, there's other plants here and there scattered throughout, but by and large, there are these monocultures of plants or, or, or zones that are dominated by just a handful of plants that make up the vast majority of the percent area cover. Okay, then we leave that area and we get up into this other area, which is a bit more sparsely vegetated. We have some of these shrubs, et cetera. And then after that, we get into more terrestrial area. So areas, so zonation is clearly apparent. Uh, so here's a, here's a generalized breakdown of the, the elevational distribution of a, salt mar a California salt marsh. Okay, so we have the Tidal Creek right here, the low, the low point. Um, now this could be either a tidal channel or a lagoon which is just a, a, an embayment, a large area of water. We might have some Spartina here. We don't have this in all of our marshes, but we might have some Spartina. Um, uh, for now, I'm just gonna talk about the, the, gene, the genus of the plant. So the species actually matters. This is Spartina foliosa, this is the native. We have an invader, an invasive Spartina that's complicating things and causing lots of problems. But for now, we're just gonna call this Spartina. Okay, uh, and then we get up into, and so this is the wettest part of the wetland. Then we get up into this area that's, you know, wetted probably every day, uh, but, but uh, nevertheless not as wet as this area right next to the water. And so this would be uh, the middle zone or the mid, mid plain. And this would be things like pickleweed, salicornia, the technically the Scientific name has changed, but we're just going to call it Salicornia for now, Salicornia virginica. Um, and so this is this is the Salicornia zone, the pickleweed zone. And then we get up into the up the upper transition to the terrestrial area. It's not the terrestrial yet, but it's the transition. And this is the place that's really only occasionally inundated. So when we when we have a huge in, embayment or entrapment, or when we have um, you know uh, winter rains, that kind of thing. And so this is going to be Things like, uh, notice salicornia is here as well, but whereas salicornia here is forming mostly a monoculture, up here it's but one component of um, many things. It, does, it doesn't dominate, it's not the dominant species. We have things like frankinia, things like disticulus, things like lamus, um, uh, and then shrubby, more shrubby type things like brindelia, this big sort of uh, sticky, aster sticky sort of sunflower looking plant. And so diverse stuff. So we go from relatively not diverse, close to the water, relatively not diverse, but a bit more diverse on the marsh plain, and then really more of the diversity in this upper edge, the, the fringing edge of the marsh. So again, zonation really explaining a lot of what's going on. And so well, we're not talking about restoration today, but when we get back to talking about restoration, right, you can use this knowing that certain plants are going to grow in certain areas as you're designing your palette, you can use that to your advantage and you can, you can plant certain critters in certain areas, or if you want to encourage certain species, you're going to know that you need to have that be say a bit higher, have the topology be a bit pointy in this area or a bit of a lump, right? Or maybe you need to have a bit of a depression to encourage those species to grow. 
Um, okay, uh, we can also talk about uh, the notion of succession. So zonation is really important, or uh, an important aspect of community ecology for us. The other one is going to be succession. Can somebody tell me the definition of succession, or, or would you guys remember what succession is from some of your other classes? Uh, uh everybody's asleep. Succession. Somebody tell me what, what we mean by succession, ecological succession. Isn't it, um, <clears throat> it's like a, pro like a process in an ecosystem that changes over a certain period of time, given right. like, the diversity of plants? Yes, good. Thanks, man. That's good. So, right. So it's, it's, uh, it can be with everything but it's most easily seen with plants. But it's the idea of going from a disturbed state that could come from a wildfire, that could come from people putting in a parking lot, that could come from uh, uh, massive, over, massive overgrazing by a buffalo herd, you know, whatever. But, but there's, there's some disturbance. The system is tweaked. And then the system changes through, it's, it's, a, it's a predictable, change of the the critters that are in that area over time so you start with the early colonizers the things that can first blow in either either they can crawl in very fast they can disperse in very fast they can start to grow very fast and so those organisms if we're talking about plants let's talk about those plants will will the, in the first weeks days weeks months whatever it is they're going to get in there fast and start to grow and, you know, and take over the area. So if we po popped in there right after the disturbance, let's say right after the fire, we would look and we'd say, oh, there's nothing here. Or at least with regards to macroscopic vegetation, with regards to plants, nothing's here. We come back in a month and we, or a month or two, whatever, we see a bunch of grasses growing up. I'm like, ah, so now there's plants here, right? But the grasses maybe don't look like the forest that was there before, let's say, right? And then we come back, uh, you know, I don't know, a year later, and we see more diverse things. There's still some grass there, but there's more diverse things. There's things with broader leaves and things of that nature. Come back a year later, and maybe there's some shrubs. There's some woody, woody plants starting to grow in there, and, and et cetera. And until eventually we get a forest that is, um, again, in that, in that area. So that's the notion of succession. So we can think of this zonation also in, in so, so this, this first way to think about it, this is as, a, as zonation, right? An elevational prediction of where things are. That's fine. We can also think of it in the context of succession. So if we're, if we're talking about this as a perspective of, of a vegetated community, this area here gets disturbed a lot in the sense of getting flooded a lot. You guys with me? So we start right here and every day this water is low and then it comes high. And so every day, this lowest part, this mudflat area, or, or virtually every day, is going to get disturbed, disturbed with water, flooded, right? This area in the mid-marsh, maybe not every single day, but probably most days, it's going to get disturbed, right? This part that's up here is disturbed with flooding only infrequently. And so we can also think of that as the, the area that's most disturbed tends to be more lightly vegetated. The area that's uh, the so yeah yeah the area that's most disturbed is 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 the le less vegetated, the area that's the least disturbed, the most vegetated, the most biomass. The if we if we were to chop down all the the tissues here and weigh them in a per unit square meter area, right? This stuff is going to be woody. It's going to weigh more. It's going to it's going to be it's going to be taller on average. That kind of stuff. So it's going to be more biomass. And um, so we see, and so succession is a useful tool for us. So for example, here is um, Wayne Souza's classic um, study uh, of, uh, in this case, this was stuff in the intertidal. This is algae in the intertidal, but it applies to inter wetlands as well. So what he did is he went in, doesn't matter uh, the specifics here, just look at the, the, the graphs. Okay, so here this is, we're, going, we're talking about time on this axis. This is going from start, to a, a long a point in the future, okay? 
Um, and this, this is the months of the year when he was doing it, if, you, if you're wondering what the letters are. But basically it just goes from time zero to time in the future, right? a couple years in the future. And this is how much cover these different critters are, okay? Again, don't worry about the species, don't worry about the names right now, we're not, this isn't a class on phycology. But check it out. What we see initially, and so he went in and he, he made the disturbance. So he went with the blowtorch, so he killed stuff. He waited for low tide and he sterilized the area. Uh, okay, so initially we start, and initially right here, there's zero. There's, there's, there's no cover because there's nothing alive there in terms of algae. Okay, then we go through time, and look what happens. All of a sudden, initially, boom, the green dudes, this is Ulva, this is a green, a very thin, uh, very fast-growing algae, macroalga. Um, this this guy's boom, right? He's just growing, growing incredibly fast. So within just a couple months, look, this stuff is now 65-ish percent cover of the area. That's huge. But that that's its that's its heyday, right? That's like it's it's the football player in high school, right? That goes to the prom or the cheerleader that goes to prom or whatever the hell, right? So they're like, oh my God, they peaked. They peaked in high school, right? You guys are awesome because you guys didn't peak in high school. You guys are doing great. But they peaked in high school. Lame. And now, oh my God, life's so sucky, right? So now everything's like tanking, 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 tanking. This is tanking, not because there's something inherently bad about the green. It's tanking because these other lines are coming up. So these slower growing organisms are starting to come on. And it turns out these slower growing organisms are better competitors. So if there's nobody here, the green is the fastest getter to the spot. So it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's winning the sprint and boom, is there, okay? And then for a short period of time, for a few months, king of the hill, right? But then these other folks are coming in and they are a superior competitor. Every time you put up this blue versus this green, the blue will win. And then over time, then the pink starts coming in and the pink starts bettering the others and et cetera. And so what we're seeing is a series of successional waves. You guys get, you guys get that with me? We're seeing this series of this organism comes in peaks and then dies back. In some cases, dies back totally. Like look at the ulva. The ulva is basically virtually non-existent after a couple of years, right? It's pretty much nowhere. Other ones, like this light blue, this light blue is, is not as abundant as it was here, but it's still there, right? So, the, the, so the, they're, they're still around. And it turns out this is, what is, is one of the ways you can maintain diversity, right? So if we do nothing, if, there, if, things, aren't, if there, things are disturbed too much, we can get only green, right? Because everything's constantly being whacked, 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 killed, killed. If we go out every day with a blowtorch or every couple of months and with a blowtorch, we're basically going to be supporting this one type of organism and selecting for these types of critters. If we never disturb it, we're going to have the competitive dominance essentially always win, eventually always win. So the sweet spot is sort of in between where we're not getting disturbed all the time and we're not getting... Um, uh, 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 never having disturbance at all. This is the so-called intermediate disturbance hypothesis, but, but, uh, but you guys get the idea. Does that make sense? Okay, so we can think of salt marsh wetlands, salt marsh wetland succession as a progression from disturbed or denuded area to mature or more fully vegetated area. Sometimes people use the word natu natural su succession. I don't like that term at all, but it's when people say that, they're actually referring to ecological succession. And so a lot of times what we're trying to do with our restorations is in some way, shape or form, mimic that natural or ecological succession, that natural process of events. Now, we might wanna do this for a couple of reasons. Uh, well, you guys tell me, what, why might we want to emulate this aspect of community ecology in a restoration? Guesses. Guess. I know we haven't thought about this, all, but just... Because why, it's why, a natural why, why, system? Say again, Loretta, you couldn't hear you. Because it's a natural system? I'm pretty sure she said because it's a natural system. Okay, right, because it's a natural system, uh, but, but why? So, so, but on a more logistic sale, yes, it's a natural system, good. But why might one, well, we want to use this eventually as one of our possible approaches to doing restoration? 
because it allows for diversity within the different populations that are going to pop up. Yes. So it's a way of, of so we can figure out where we want to be in that successional pathway, right? Maybe you have no money. Maybe you're poor, right? Maybe you have little time. So maybe that your approach is going to be to create more of an early successional wetland, right? With the idea that over time, it's going to come fill in, right? So maybe we want to set the stage so that, this is Field of Dreams hypothesis to be sure, but maybe we want to set the stage so that um, we make it relatively easy for that succession to happen or that succession to happen faster. Maybe if we just left it plain, maybe it would take, I don't know, decade, 15 years for that succession to go through. Maybe if we do some tweaks, and we'll talk about that eventually, we could tweak it to sort of jumpstart it. So maybe we can get to, the to more of the intermediate level of succession in five years as opposed to 15 years, right? Something of that nature. Uh, so logistics are one reason we might want to use a successional approach, right? Logistics because of time, logistics because of money. Um, uh, other, other, other reasons why, we, why a successional framework might be helpful for a restoration, other than it's natural and, and all that good stuff. I think... I think some species require others first before they're able to emerge. Right, right, exactly. So some of the conditions might be such that um, we might have enough money, but it might just still be so logistically difficult that we couldn't make the soil exactly ready for plant species A, let's say, right? So it really is gonna take getting the soil nutrients correct getting the organic carbon levels correct, you know, that kind of stuff. And, you know, for us to do that might be just prohibitively expensive. But if we sort of plant the, or, 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 or artificially jumpstart the restoration to the succession level right before that plant comes in, we could, we could help get that, right? Also, it could just be the fact that m many of these plants we can't get. Right? So many of these, many of these organisms, uh, uh, so, so there, there's sort of the white, the so-called white lab rats, right? Things that everybody uses, right? If you, if, if you want a lab rat, I can get you a lab rat, right? Um, uh, if you want a rabbit, I can get you a rabbit. Don't say that, my family will get upset, but I can get you a rabbit. But, you know, in experimental context, there's a demand for certain things, right? So if we want, if we want live, uh, rabbits or rodents for experiments, we can get those. There's a huge problem right now with COVID-19. There's a, there's a lack of supply of monkeys to the biomedical industry because people want to use monkeys to challenge their immune system and see if they have the, uh, the antibodies to COVID-19. So there's a, there's a roadblock. We don't, we, we don't, there's a bottleneck. We don't have that many monkeys right now for use in biomedical testing, um, setting aside all the ethics of doing experiments on monkeys. But, but, um, uh, so in the restoration is the same thing. So there's certain organisms that we can order. You can order online as seeds. You can call up a native plant nursery and they'll have these plants, you know, growing. Or you can contract with a native plant nursery to, um, to you know, hey, I'm going to need, in, I'm doing this restoration in six months. I need 300 of this plant. And they could say, okay, good. We'll grow it for you, right? But then there's a whole nother subset of plants, the vast majority of plants in any restoration or the vast majority of, of animals in any restoration that we just simply, we can't get them. They're just, we don't know how to grow them or, or, or reproduce them or it's just too difficult or whatever. So for all those reasons, we're never gonna be able to create a fully mature wetland or marsh instantly no matter how hard we try. But we could pick the successional level or the successional state just before those critters come in and help to encourage any of those individuals, say dispersing in the air, flying by, whatever, to indeed settle out in this area and make it look attractive to them. So there's, there's several reasons why we might wanna use a successional framework, at least as one possible option as we're thinking about how we wanna go about doing our restoration. Okay, so for um, a simplified, 
succession for a salt marsh, we're going to be going, uh, so, so here's the place. So open, or here, here's the range of from disturbance, or you can also think about this as, as the starting from, from a restoration, uh, disturbance in a natural system or, or progress in the, in the restoration. Um, the most disturbed area tends to be open water, then mud flat, then sparsely vegetated uh, community. Then we get um, that, that sparsely vegetated community tends to accrue fine sediments and tends to accrue, nut therefore, nutrients, therefore, uh, organic stuff and, and, and a more complex seed bank, et cetera. In turn, we tend to get other plants coming in. We turn to, tend to get more biomass. And then the next stage, uh, number five right here, is um, uh, heavily vegetated marsh and much more diverse plant assemblages. If left to its own device in a, in a classic salt marsh system, um, some will tend to dominate. Some will tend to, to become the community dominant, either the shrubs or the pickleweed or whatever, depends on the sort of elevation, but will tend to get um, uh, monocultures or at least less diverse plant palettes. Professor? Yeah. Wouldn't it also be important to be looking at the uh microorganisms and fungal communities that might absolutely. be absolutely plants absolutely completely agree in fact there's now there's now um uh uh companies that will supply um mycorrhizae that you plant with um the 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 vegetation as you're going out and seeding them so a few of you are in my coastal class if, if we hopefully get to do our coastal management class and we get up to the central coast, we can look at some coastal prairies. I used to do some coastal grassland restoration, some coastal prairies. And it turns out one of the best predictors is as to whether the native plants will thrive is do they have an intact soil microbial community? If they do, a great chance that you can restore that system relatively easily. You'll get diverse plants and all that kind of stuff. If it's been nuked, it'll be very, very hard to recover that native plant community. Um, turns out in the salt marsh, because of the salt water and stuff, we, the, the importance of mycorrhizae and stuff isn't as important as in terrestrial areas. That might be because we just don't have the technological capacity to detect mycorrhizae in the salt marsh. But it, it also may well be because of the different nature of the system. The salt water, et cetera, is, is hard on fungus. And so, yeah. Yeah. so there's good reason to believe that, that that's not as big a deal in salt marshes. But you're right. When we get to other, other wetlands, absolutely that can be important. Absolutely. And, and, I'll, and also, I'm just talking here as an introductory context about the stuff we see above ground. There's a okay. massive ecology below ground. So even if it's not microbial, there's rhizominous things, there's in fauna, there's all kinds of stuff. It's very, 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 very important what goes on below the surface. Um, and sometimes we get tricked into only focusing on what we can easily see. But excellent point. Other questions? Okay, so uh, let's see, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna, uh, we'll stop here in a second because we're almost near our break, but um, so, okay. So uh, the thing I really wanna point out with succession is the same thing we need to point out with evolution. Uh, silly, foolish people that don't fully understand biology have sometimes taken the wrong lesson from some of these things. So be very careful for words such as better or worse, improvement. In a successional context, all of the successional time frame is important. All of it is important. I'll say that again. The entire successional timeline is important. We, there's always going to be winners. There's always going to be losers at any point in time, right? So if I go back and look at here, it's not as if this ulva dominated system is quote unquote bad, right? It's that we need this whole graph. We need this whole frame of reference. That is the system, right? The system always has or, or the inner tidal always has areas that have been disturbed and always has areas that have been um, uh, uh, undisturbed for a long period of time, right? This, the, the great thing about the system is that 
we want to have pockets of all of these sprinkled up and down the coast, right? We want areas that have been disturbed that are ulva dominated. We want areas that are really diverse. So that's, that's a healthy ecosystem. So as we're talking about using or applying these lessons in a restoration context, we might initially jump to a particular phase of that succession because um, we might want to be encouraging this endangered species that can't wait another 10 years for this to come along, right? So we want to use the strength of succession, but just remember that um, it's not as if one point in the successional arc is better than another, it's just different. So it's better to think of things in terms of early successional communities, mid successional communities, climax or late successional communities or phases, right? So, so ideally we're making a dynamic system and we're making a system that can function on its own and be disturbed and be resilient and all that good stuff. Initially in the restoration, disturbance is kind of bad, right? Because we're, we're just getting stuff established, too much stress too early can be bad. But with the exception of that, you know, disturbance is a good thing and, and all this stuff is a good thing. Um, and if you, if you are talking about which, uh, for your particular design, I want to use a, a, a mid-successional plant palette, right? That's okay. But just make sure you're saying that, again, being explicit with our assumptions. I'm saying that this, is a, this would be a better design because it would support this endangered species within, a, within five years or, or something of that nature. So, uh, so avoid better and worse. If you have to use them, define them and explain why in the context of your proposal, your design, your thinking. Um, okay, so I think, I think that's a good place to stop for now. So I'll, I'll, we'll pick this up later, but we're um, just about at our, at our um, break. So I'm going to, oh, let me, I'll just ask any questions before I, I, I kick us off on our break. Any, any guys questions about that uh, zonation succession stuff? Professor, can you possibly repeat the statement that started the entire successional? Sorry, Loretta, you cut out. You said, can I repeat the statement that started and then I... Let me... It started the entire successional? Uh, okay, not, I'm not sure what I was saying, but I think I probably, somebody else can maybe remind me, but I think I was saying that the entire successional like, like this thing, the entire successional arc, the entire successional um, um, pathway is important. All of it is important. The early successional is important. The mid successional is important. The late succession is important. It's not as if we're trying to pick one particular um, uh, a phase of, uh, of succession and use that for our restoration. We might wanna start our restoration with that particular phase, but but in a in a well functioning wetland, we should be able to handle all these different phases of restoration. Unless it, unless if if the restoration was the size of my couch or the size of my office, ugh, we probably couldn't handle all phases of restoration. But if it's any realistically sized thing, right, should be able to handle a little disturbance in this area. It should be able to handle a dog taking a dump on this part. It should be able to handle a hawk landing and ripping up uh, uh, a prey item and leaving bones there, an ant colony forming and making an ant colony, that, right? So, so all parts of the, of the successional spectrum are part of a healthy system. So I just, because I just talked about this, sometimes when I talk about succession, people think, the desirous point is the climax community or the, or the most diverse state. We might want to have the most diverse state as one of our starting points because we're trying to encourage a diverse plant palette in our community initially, but, but, um, but this is a process. Succession is a process. It's not a point in time. It's a, it's a dynamic component of a healthy, well-functioning ecosystem. If we have a healthy restoration and we have a healthy system, therefore it should, it should change over time. And it should, a disturbance shouldn't be a bad word. Does that make sense? Okay, thank that you. Already? Okay, any other thing else didn't make sense or I said something that was confusing? Okay, 
I got I got eleven o'clock on my um, my uh, time, so we're gonna uh, pause it here. You guys take your ten minute stretch. We're gonna come back and and get back to talking about where we are with our field of dreams stuff, and and start looking at your guys' questions and, and problems you had and questions you had. Cool. I'll see everybody in ten minutes. <laughs>